This just might be the most important list for the 21st century Afro-descended woman. What up African world, it's your boy Home Team here. I'm back at it with another video of African history, culture, and worldview. And today I want to talk about the top 10 queens in African history. To begin, this is not a popularity contest. So the standard of this list is not solely based on the queen's popularity, but many other factors like power, influence, and overall impact on African history. Let's begin. Coming in at number 10, we have Queen Nefertiti. Honestly, the only reason she made this list is because I pretty much couldn't ignore her. Her popularity has certainly stood the test of time, and that is greatness in and of itself. But she also passed my other specifications. Nefertiti's husband is pretty much known for ridding Egypt of all of its gods and advancing the idea of monotheism with the worship of the supreme god Aten. Although he is largely credited with this, Queen Nefertiti played a large role in maintaining this idea in support of her husband. She was literally a part of one of the largest religious revolutions in Egyptian history outside of the 25th dynasty Nubian kings. On top of that, she was well known for her beauty. Number nine, we have Queen Gudi. Now virtually no one knows about Queen Gudi, largely because Western scholars pretty much ignore her. But Gudi was a legendary Jewish queen that's known throughout African oral history. She's largely believed to have come from the Sadamo people of Southern Ethiopia. Now Gudi single-handedly destroyed the Aksumite Empire located in northern Ethiopia. She burned down churches, she destroyed monuments, and she almost eliminated the entire royal family of Aksum. Even today in the Ethiopian countryside, Ethiopians speak of her reign as queen. She's widely known throughout Ethiopian oral history, but even the Arab scholar Ibn Hakel spoke about Queen Gudi. He states, and I quote, the country of the Habasha has been ruled by a woman for many years now. She has killed the king of the Habasha who was called Hadani. Until today, she rules with complete independence in her own country and the frontier areas of the country of the Hadana in the southern part of the Habasha. She's one of the few African queens that literally struck terror in the hearts of indigenous African people. Now that's power. Number eight, we have Queen Amina. Queen Amina was a legendary warrior queen of the Hausa people in northern Nigeria. The earliest account of Queen Amina proclaims that she was the first to bring about civilization amongst the Hausa people. She was widely known for her military exploits and extending Hausa rule and influence in different regions. She's credited with the construction of Hausa walls built around the city for protection. Man, talk about starting from the bottom. She single-handedly took her people to the next level. Coming in at number seven, we have Queen Amanasheketo. Queen Amanasheketo was a Kandaki queen in ancient Nubia. She came from a line of Kandaki Nubian queens that would literally fight in battle. She became very popular after her pyramid in Nubia was discovered with loads of jewelry, hinting at her vast wealth. But she makes the list because of her legendary status. She's most known for having defeated a Roman army sent by Augustus to conquer Nubia after Rome broke a treaty made by her mother. By the way, Rome made several attempts to try and conquer Nubia and failed miserably. Most of them thwarted by black women in particular. Number six, we have Queen of Sheba. The Queen of Sheba has to be one of the most legendary, influential queens in all of African history. Her legend even extends outside of Africa, and she's known by many different people by many different names. The Hebrews know her as Sheba, the Arabs know her by Bilkis, people of Kenya call her Nakuti, and the Ethiopians call her Queen Makeda. Her interaction with the Hebrew king Solomon is one of the most legendary stories in all the Abrahamic religions. A new religion was even formed because of her story alone. Her influence on the minds of Afro-descended people as a whole will probably never die. At number five, we have Ya Asantawa. Ya Asantawa was a queen in the Ashanti Empire in Ghana. She led the war against the British Empire in the 20th century. What makes Ya Asantawa so unique 
is the powerful impact she had on the minds of her people. Now many queens had a very powerful impact on their people, but Ya Asantawa's impact was very unique. In a meeting of the Asante elites to discuss how to deal with the British and to secure the return of their exiled king, there was a disagreement among them. Apparently Ya Asantawa heard enough and she stood up and addressed the Ashanti men. And the following words ensued, and I quote, Now I see that some of you fear to go forward to fight for our king. If it was in the brave days of Ose Tutu, Okumfo Anoke, and Opokuwe, chiefs would not sit down to see their king to be taken away without firing a shot. No European could have dared speak to the chiefs of Asante in the way the governor spoke to you this morning. Is it true that the bravery of Asante is no more? I cannot believe it. It cannot be. I must say this. If you the men of Asante will not go forward, then we will. We the woman will. I shall call upon my fellow women. We will fight. We will fight till the last of us falls in the battlefields. With these words, she single-handedly boosted the morale of the entire empire. And she is immortalized in Ghana today for it. Number four, we have Queen Zenga. Queen Zenga was a queen of the Bunu people in Angola. Her claim to fame was the war she waged against the Portuguese during the slave trading throughout the region. She would frequently manipulate European politics to her own benefit and the benefit of her people. Queen Zinga would literally fight in battle and she waged a 30 year war against the Portuguese and she even welcomed runaway slaves with open arms. She formed an alliance with the Dutch and gained much respect from one Dutch general in particular. The Portuguese made several attempts to try and kill Queen Zinga but all were unsuccessful. The Portuguese were never able to gain a stronghold over Angola as long as Queen Zinga was alive. Even European scholars praised Zinga because of her intelligence. Now at number three, we have Queen Amanatori. Queen Amanatori was another Kandaki queen in ancient Nubia. She breaks my top three because she was the last great builder of ancient Kush. The quantity and quality of her buildings and temples indicate that her reign was one of the most successful in all of Kushite history. Now what solidified her in my top three was her religious tolerance she seemed to have possessed during her reign. What makes any ruler great is their ability to be open-minded to different worldviews and even beliefs. And Queen Amanatori is mentioned in the Bible as such. According to the Christian Bible, Queen Amanatori allowed her eunuch to go to Jerusalem to worship and to pray. Now Queen Amanatori certainly wasn't a Christian. But the fact that she allowed people in her empire to practice their beliefs is pretty 21st century like, way ahead of her time. She was certainly an amazing woman. Coming in at number two, we have Queen Tai. Now Queen Tai was one of the most politically influential queens in Egyptian history. And she was also the grandmother of King Tut. She literally pioneered the blueprint of foreign relations for other African queens. She possessed a great deal of power during her husband and her son's reign. Queen Tai became her husband's trusted advisor and confidant, and she gained a lot of respect from foreign dignitaries. Foreign leaders were willing to deal directly through her. She continued to play an active role in foreign relations, and she was even the first Egyptian queen to have her name recorded on official acts. Not only did she win the hearts of her people, but she seemed to have genuinely won the heart of her husband. Especially considering the fact that most marriages back then were political in nature. Her husband devoted a number of shrines to her and even built temples for her in Nubia. And she was even worshipped as a goddess. It's largely believed that she was actually of Nubian extraction. He even made an artificial lake for her. Many Egyptologists like David O'Connor take great interest in Queen Tai. He says, and I quote, The unprecedented thing about Tai is not where she came from, but what she became. No previous queen ever figured so prominently in her husband's lifetime. Tai regularly appeared beside Amenhotep III in statuary, tomb and temple reliefs, and Stella, while her name is paired with his on numerous small objects, 
such as vessels and jewelry, not to mention the large commemorative scarabs, where her name regularly follows his in the date line. New elements in her portraiture, such as the addition of cows, horns, and sun discs, attributes of the goddess Hathor, to her headdress and her representation in the form of a sphinx, an image formerly reserved for the king, emphasize her role as a king's divine, as well as earthly partner. As you can see, she was a very powerful, influential woman. And finally, what you all have been waiting for, coming in at number one, we have Queen Amonorinus. Queen Amonorinus was a Kandaki queen of Nubia. She is hands down the most popular Nubian queen in all of African history. She made the number one spot because of her combination of attributes. These attributes are bravery, influence, military might, and even trash talk. Her story goes like this. The Romans conquered Egypt and pretty much tried to tax Nubians living in the area, trying to make Nubia some sort of vassal state. And Queen Amonorinus wasn't having it. So she attacked the Romans in Egypt, defeated them, brought back war captives, and cut off the head of a statue of Augustus where she buried it under a Nubian temple so her people could literally walk all over it. Now, of course, the Romans retaliated and they even had some success pushing the Nubians back down into Nubia. But Queen Amonorinus came back with a huge army, reportedly even gaining some support from the interior of Africa. And she began to march on the Romans. Now, apparently, Augustus wanted no part of that and a treaty was signed which gave in to all the demands of the Nubians. It's been said that Queen Amonorina sent a bundle of golden arrows to Augustus, and a messenger spoke to him saying, and I quote, This gift is from the Candace. If you want peace, this is a token of her warmth and friendship. If you want war, keep the arrows, because you're going to need them. And so Augustus cut his losses and apparently kept those arrows. Not only did Queen Amonorinus defend her homeland against the Romans, but she basically G'd one of the most powerful men in world history. But show guys, I'm all out. It's your boy home team. Know thyself. Remember your ancestors. Peace.